10 tips to sharing your faith and evangelizing. Number one, this is the first step, is understanding the need for salvation. If you don't understand the need for salvation, you will not have the desire to share with anyone. And some of you, you don't share with anybody, you don't wanna share with anybody because you don't know the need for salvation. If I were to ask you the world's biggest problem, many of you would say corruption, lust, greed, poverty, war, racism, abortion, new age. I mean, the list goes on. Well, those, those are all problems, but the greatest sin, write this down, the greatest um, excuse me, issue the world is facing is the issue of sin. And this, this sin is the root of everything evil. Every evil thing is the result of sin. And in the most basic sense, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they became two things, spiritually dead and separated from God. So sin separates man from God for eternity unless the sin is dealt with. Every single person who's not a Christian, who's, who is what, who you're gonna be sharing with, they have been separated from God and they are spiritually dead. They have this issue. So there's not one person that you're gonna to minister to that doesn't have the issue of separation from God and spiritual death. Spiritually, they're dead and they are eternally separated from God. That's, that's the issue that you're dealing with when you share your faith. And that issue needs a solution. Salvation solves that problem. The feeling of laying in your bed at night, looking at the ceiling, we've all had this, saying, I know there's more to life than the life I'm living. When you're lost in the world and that's how you feel, that's the issue of sin. It's you being separated from your creator. It's like a kid at Costco wandering, looking for their parents, crying, saying, where's my mom and dad? That's humanity. We sit in bed going, where's my father? Where, where, where is, where's my creator? And we wander lost, literally. Now they don't all know that they're lost because they don't need, they don't know their need for salvation. So you need to understand the need for salvation. Think about this. God creates Adam and Eve as perfect beings. The perfect nature is corrupted and replaced by what's known commonly as sinful nature. And the sinful nature produces a natural tendency to sin. And that tendency to sin gets passed down to all of Adam's descendants. You are a descendant of Adam. So you've taken on that tendency to sin. Think of baking cakes and you have a pan that you're baking cakes with and it has a dent in it, okay? The pan is dented and every single cake you make will have a dent in it because this is the form of the pan making the cakes. This is the form that we're all born into. We were all born in dented. We were all born broken. We were all born because of what Adam did in the garden. We came broken and hurting. Christ comes, says, I'm gonna provide a solution for man's sin nature and the solution is only found in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. 1 Corinthians 15.3, Christ died for our sins. 1 John 1, 1.9 tells us that Jesus can forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of us all in righteousness. Galatians 1.4 says, Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil world. Ephesians 1.7 says, in whom Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Hebrews 1.3 says, Jesus purged our sins. First Peter 3 18 says Christ also has suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. Friend, I came to tell you that history shows that Jesus is the only person who ever died for the sins, whoever died for the sins of the world, rose again and proved everything he said was true. Jesus dealt with the issue of sin by his death and resurrection on the cross. We, oh man, I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm excited tonight. We are no longer separated from God. We are no longer spiritually dead. We've been given the spirit of adoption. We've been given the spirit of Christ. We've been raised into new life. We've been raised from that spiritual death, reconnected to God. So that issue of separation has been dealt with on the cross. So you need to know the message of Jesus. A real man came, a real man died, and a real man rose again and gave us his spirit so that now we can be born again. That's, that's the good news. The good news is you don't have to live hopeless. The good news is you don't have to live separate from your creator. You don't have to lay in bed and go, what? there has to be more to life than this. But now there's destiny, there's purpose, there's wholeness, there's healing. There's spiritual breakthrough, there's deliverance, all these things. Salvation is the most 
valuable gift anyone can ever receive. And you can give people that through the good news. Many of you have been here, say for years, and you don't even know the value of your salvation. You, you literally operate like a homeless person with $10 million in the bank. You're like, I'm starving, I have nowhere to live, and there's $10 million in the bank. You, you starve every day with $10,000 in your pocket. We don't realize what we have. A million dollars a month, and you live in a spiritual cardboard box. And God says, value your salvation. Like, are you even grateful for Christ's work on the cross and reconnecting you? He, Hebrews 2 describes salvation as a great salvation. And it says, how can we neglect this such a great salvation and expect to escape damnation? We've been given this value. I want you to value this tonight. I want you to go, man, my salvation. Thank you, Lord. It's valuable. Now, some of the benefits are salvation of salvation are forgiveness of sins, new life, peace with God, peace of mind, joy, hope for your future, God's presence in you, eternal life. God's supernatural power. I mean, think about just number one I just gave you, forgiveness of all sins. What? God says, I'll forgive you of every past sin. You've done every terrible thing. In the eyes of God, you are a murderer. You are a thief. You are a blasphemer. You're a luster, a liar, an adulterer. You've done all of it. You've literally broken every law. And God says, you deserve hell for eternity, punishment, separation from me. But through the blood of Jesus, God says, I forgive all your sins. And you're gonna sit here tonight and say, oh, I don't really know if I, if I should share my faith. I'm kind of scared. What do you mean? What do you mean, why are you excited, Isaiah? Peace of mind, peace with God. You know, the Bible says you are at war with God, but through the shedding of blood, you're now at peace with God. <sighs> my mind is blown. I'm at peace with God. I spent years at war with God, disobeying him. And because of what Jesus did, not even, I didn't even do it. Jesus did it. I'm now at peace with God. Do we even realize that peace with God? Like you were at war with him and now you're at peace with him. Joy, hope for your future, something you never had. Eternal life, have we, have we even discussed that yet? Spending forever with God. Are you, are you getting the value here? God's supernatural power. My body could be healed. The demons will come out of me. What do you, what? This is amazing. Why has nobody told me this? This is the good news of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you this because number one tip of sharing your faith is understanding the need for salvation and valuing it. Valuing it. How can somebody give up this? I don't even know. How could you backslide? What do you even mean? People say, Isaiah, would you ever go back? What would I go back to? My vomit, anxiety, depression, emptiness, hopelessness, fear? Like, is that even a question? For those of you that just got saved again from backsliding, what are you, what were you thinking? What were you, what do you, what is so good that you are willing to lose all of these benefits and, and relationship with your creator to go to a club, to go have some girl grind on you, to go have a one night stand, to put a needle in your arm and get a little fix and snort some white powder so you feel good for five hours? What are you, what is wrong with you? You're, you're willing to trade relationship with creator Yahweh God for some white powder that you sniffed off of a bathroom toilet. What are you, what is wrong with us? Of all that God has done, and you're like, I just don't know if I can do this much longer. Okay, so where are you going? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do, go back and serve the devil? You know how much the devil's gonna destroy your life after you turned on him, now you're gonna go back to him? He's gonna wreak all the havoc on your life? There's nothing to go back to. Burn the boat, burn the bridge, and serve God forever. I have nothing to go back to. The devil is a liar, I'm never going back. Sorry, not sorry. I mean, really, we gotta get to this place, guys, where we're like, what, what is wrong with me? I just feel like I'm giving up. Polycarp was a Christian martyr. Listen to this. When he faced giving up his faith, they basically told him, if you give up your faith, we will not martyr you. And these are, these are his exact words from Polycarp the martyr. 80 and, six, 80 and six years have I served him and have never, and he's never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who has saved me? And they killed him right after he said that. He did not prefer his life. He said, I will not give up my salvation. I would rather give up my life than my salvation. Look at the value of his salvation. Even in the face of death, Polycarp says, how could I blaspheme my king, my Lord, my savior? We got to get to that place where we're willing to die for this thing. We're willing to really die for the gospel. I'm going to give you guys 
to help you share your faith. 20 verses I want you to memorize. This is your homework. School's in session. I have my glasses on. School's in session. Professor Isaiah has a word for you. 20 Bible verses. I need you guys to write these fast because I don't have time to go into all these. I'm going to give you 20 verses that I want you to memorize that are going to help you share your faith. Are you ready? 20. Write these down. Number one, John 3, 16. You need to know that by memory. These are all, you need to know all these by memory. I'm going to memorize all these as well. Number two, Revelation 3.20. Number three, write fast. Romans 3.23. Number four, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Number five, Romans 6.23. Number seven, number six, Romans 10, 19. I'm sorry, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Okay, number seven, 1 John 5.12. Number eight, Isaiah 53. Chapter 53, verse 6. Number, was that number 8? Okay, I don't know. Number 9, 1 Peter 2, 24. Number 10, 1 John 1, 9. You can rewatch this later if you're not fast enough. It's okay. Number 11, Acts 16, 31. Number 12, John 3, 3. Number 13, John 1, 12. Number 14, Proverbs 14, 12. Number 15, Romans 5, 8. Number 16, Luke 19 and 10. Not, chapter 19, verse 10. Number 17, John 10, 10. I know I'm going too fast. Rewatch it. Number 18, Isaiah 59, verse 2. Number 19, John 14, 6. And number 20, Hebrews 9, 27. You can memorize those. Okay, I want you to memorize all 20 of those verses. These are going to help you witness and share your faith. Well, rewatch it. It's okay. This will be on YouTube forever hopefully. So you can rewatch it after. Don't stress. If you didn't write them down, it's all good. Okay. That's tip number one. And the rest are going to go quicker. Number two, tip number two, share your testimony. One of the simplest and most effective methods of witnessing is by sharing your personal testimony of your salvation. A simple definition of witnessing is that you tell others what you know about God, what Jesus has done, what he's done in your life and what he can do for them. Number two is share your testimony. Here's why I love sharing my testimony when I witness. This is my number one strategy I use is because nobody can dispute your testimony. Nobody can tell you that you weren't blind. Nobody can tell you that you weren't lost. Nobody can say, well, you weren't addicted to alcohol, Isaiah, or you weren't addicted to pornography, or you weren't addicted to this. Nobody can dispute your testimony. How are you going to tell me what I was? You, and you see this in scripture over and over again, the man who's lame, the man who's blind, the man who's demonized, the people say, wasn't that the lame man? How is he walking? Wasn't that the blind man? How is he seeing? Wasn't that the deaf man? How is he hearing? Nobody can dispute your testimony. How are they going to tell you that God hasn't done it? So start by sharing your testimony. When I got saved, my family didn't recognize me. My friend said, who are you? Literally, I sat with one of my best friends that I was best friends with since I was eight years old. I get saved 11 years after he meets me. I'm 19 now. And he, said, and he sat down with me at breakfast and said, I don't know you. Who are you? Like, you're not the same person. And I can confidently quote Colossians 3.3, 3, for you died to this life and your life is hidden in Christ, with, in Christ, in God. Your life is new. You died. You're a new creature. Share that testimony. And when you do share your testimony, I'm going to give you practical tips to write down. I'm, I'm literally going to give you step-by-step step how to do this. Try to be progressive, okay? When you start by sh sharing, share where you came from, where you are now. This is important. Stay away from religious jargon. Do not go into all this religion stuff. Do not start sharing things that they don't even know. Even using the word lost, they don't even know what you're talking about. Like, what do you mean you were lost? What were you lost from? When you use the word, you're not saved, they're like, what do I need to be saved from? This is why you need to know, do not use religious jargon. Some of you go witness, you're like, I don't know why no one listens to me witness. And when you go witness, you're like telling them the Lord pulled me out of the miry clay and put my feet on solid rock. And the person's like, what is miry clay? What is solid rock? Don't use that religious talk. Don't be religious about it. Use the Bible, use your testimony, but use terms they can understand. The point of sharing your testimony is to get you to connect with the person that's not saved. So don't be telling them about the miry clay. Don't be telling them about the healing balm of Gilead. Okay. Don't be telling them about how the hounds of heaven have been chasing them. Don't be trying to, don't be trying to use all this stuff. They don't know what you mean. They're new. They're lost. You talk to them like you know that they understand. You don't use all this, you know, Hey, you're going to hell. Did you know that? It's like, how's that going to help them? Share your testimony, your experience is my favorite tool right here. So let me give you 
very basic we're still on we're still on tip number two but i'm gonna make it so easy i'm, I'm you're gonna have no excuse after tonight three steps to share your testimony very simple write this down step one your life before you were saved this is how you share your testimony step one share about your life before you're saved tell them about how you acted and some of y'all acted crazy like i did tell them about your attitude how you felt when you were addicted maybe you had issues addictions how lost you felt how broken you were relate to the person i always like to say man i was depressed i was anxious i was addicted i start telling them how messed up i was that's the start of my testimony and then maybe even ask the holy spirit for a word of knowledge to reach that person okay so number one step is life before you were saved very simple remember this step two so now you've told them how jacked up you were it's very simple now you're in step two how you were saved what were you going through when you got saved how did you come to hear the good news where were you what did it feel like what was your experience don't leave out any details tell them man i came to a church man i was at an altar maybe you were in your basement maybe you were on your porch when god touched you encountered you maybe you heard the voice of god maybe he knocked you off your rocker maybe he gave you a vision maybe you just heard a powerful sermon and the spirit of god filled you what was your encounter like tell your experience how did you get saved tell them how you got saved don't just say well god saved me well how i always love to tell people well, i heard this i experienced this i woke up the next day i had no desire to do this i had no desire to do that i didn't sleep for three i go into my testimony detail of how i got saved that's number two and then number three last step is the change that happened since you've been saved okay so changes in your life since you've been saved so now you told them what you were how you got saved very simple keep it simple and now you tell them this is how my life has been now i no longer am addicted now i no longer do what i used to do my attitude is different my outlook on life is different i'm no longer bitter i'm no longer angry i'm no longer racist i no longer look at women like they're just pieces of meat walking around i am no longer the person that i was i don't drink anymore i don't cuss anymore how did that happen it wasn't religion the spirit of god made me become a new creature and I no longer have the desires I used to have. I'm out of that bondage. I was delivered. I was healed. Share about your life. They want to know that your life is different. They don't just want it. Oh, you just go to church Sunday. That's not life change. Anybody can go to church Sunday. The difference is my actual life changed. That's what they want to know. So step one, life before. Step two, how I got saved. I'm helping somebody tonight. Type one if I'm helping you. Step three, what my life is like now. That's sharing your faith using your testimony. Tip number three. Okay, this is a good one here. Ask questions and let them talk. Okay, when you're witnessing to somebody, do not dominate the conversation. Let them talk. Ask them questions like, do you believe in the afterlife? What do you think happens when you die? How do you feel about God? Do you feel fulfilled in your life? Speak to that void. Do you ever feel like something is missing? Remember, every person that you're witnessing to, sharing with, preaching to, they have a void. They have a hole in them that God has put there that only he can fill. So preach to the void. Talk to them about the emptiness in them and how God wants to fill that void. Here's a good question. Okay, go, go and ask this. When you're witnessing to your friends, family, coworkers, people in public, suppose you were to die today and stand before God and God says, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? That's a good question to ask. And that will create a dialogue of maybe they say, I never really thought about that. I never really thought about what God wants to do in my life now or where I'm going when I die or judgment day. Remember guys, these are all things no one's ever talked to them about. No one ever shared their faith with me. No one ever witnessed to me and said, this is the gospel, you're going to hell. No one told me I was going to hell and I needed to hear it. So some people need to hear about hell. There's a real place called hell and you're not gonna stand before God being a liar, a cheater and a thief thinking you're going to get in and ray comfort has a lot of this content even on his channel of how to do this but that's a good one number three is ask questions number four this is important and this is one you're not going to hear anybody say you'll not find this on an article this is very important number four do not cheapen the gospel do not make the gospel sound cheap you need to make sure that they know there is a cost to following jesus when you're witnessing to somebody, your goal is not to get them to repeat the sinner's prayer. That is not your goal. Your goal should be make a disciple. That's your goal. Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he can't be my disciple. And this is Jesus speaking. If you don't hate your wife, kids, and your own life in comparison to me, you can't be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross cannot be my disciple. 
For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down, count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, he's going to lay the foundation, not be able to finish it, and people are going to mock him saying, this man began to build something but couldn't finish it. This is what Jesus is saying. The world mocks us because we become Christian and we don't pay the price and we're not real Christians. We sit down and start being a Christian and we don't finish and we don't follow through. So salvation is free, but it will cost you everything. So you're wasting your time if you're like, oh, I led them to the Lord. Let me just give you my biggest pet peeve. And I know I'm gonna make a lot of you mad. What else is new? Here's my biggest pet peeve. When I have evangelist friends, pastor friends, and we're at the conference and they say, oh man, I just led my Uber driver to the Lord, okay? And I know some of them are watching, you, it's okay. It's okay, you, we could still be friends. Text me after and I'll pray with you. And I go, oh, you did, what happened? Oh, we were driving over here and I told them about Jesus and I, I told them, do they wanna say the sinner's prayer? And in five minutes from the start of my drive to the end, they repeated the sinner's prayer and now they're saved. No, they're not. That's not Bible. The Bible does not say, Go in somebody's Uber, tell them Jesus is Lord. Would you like to repeat a prayer? Have them repeat the prayer, get out of the taxi or get out of the Uber and now they're saved. That's not biblical. Our job is to make disciples, not get them to repeat a prayer. So if we're walking around trying to see how many people we can get to repeat the sinner's prayer, that is not salvation. Jesus did not do that. Paul did not do that. Peter did not do that. And I'm gonna make some of you even more mad. There's no sinner's prayer in the Bible. If you didn't know, the sinner's prayer is the greatest lie that's ever been created. There's no such thing as repeat a prayer and now you're saved, live however you want. That is not the call. The call is to share the gospel and to make disciples. So if you're not willing to disciple them, then you should not be sharing with them. Let me say that again. If you're not willing to disciple those people, I'm not talking about at a church, on a stage, a crusade, outdoor preaching. I'm talking about if you are witnessing to somebody and you're not willing to turn them into a disciple, you should not be sharing your faith because all you're gonna do is give them false pretenses and they're gonna say a prayer and live the same. And then the next person that comes and really tries to witness, they're gonna say, oh, I already, I'm already a Christian because I prayed a prayer when some lukewarm evangelist got me to repeat after him. All right, I had to give you that there. Mark 8, 34, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said, if anyone wants to come after me, so this is Jesus speaking, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, okay? That's the prerequisite, and take up his cross and follow him, me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the world but lose his soul? Wait a minute, Jesus. I thought we just had to pray a prayer and invite you to build a treehouse in our, in our heart. But you're telling me that if anyone wants to come after me, I have to deny myself, take up a cross, hate my life and lay my life down. That's the gospel we should be preaching. Do not undersell the gospel. Matthew 8, 22. If you need more, if you need more evidence, here you go. And Jesus said, follow me and leave the dead to bear their own dead. Okay, so lay it, lay it all down. Jesus always, and if you don't know how to spell always, it's A-L-W-A-Y-S, always commanded people to leave everything. And this hasn't changed just because we're in 2022 and we've commercialized the gospel. Jesus did not make people repeat a prayer. He told them to give up everything. And if people weren't willing, he would say, you're not ready to follow me. So our goal is not to beg people to live lukewarm. Our goal is to preach the real gospel. Don't cheapen the gospel, preach repentance. What must we do? You must repent. Don't be cheap about it. It's not cheap. It's not a game. Number five, tip number five. This is good. We're almost done here is be ready to disciple them. Write that down. Many of you, that are witnessing to somebody, you might need to build a relationship. This is not about numbers. This is about quality, not quantity. So you might need to build a relationship with them before they'll even listen to you. There's no point in leading them if you won't disciple them. Get their number, okay? And again, if you're a married man and you meet a single girl and you're witnessing to her, do not get her number. Give her your wife's number. That's the smart way to do it. But you need to get the person's contact information you need to build a relationship with them. You need to connect them to a local church and you need to be willing to meet up with them. Hey, do you want to meet for a Starbucks Bible study? Hey, give them a Bible, give them Christian material, show them some Christian YouTube channels. Hello, this is a good one that they can learn from, but don't just get them saved and then toss them over to the enemy and think they're going to be fine. You need to connect with them and you need to connect them. If you, it's a female, connect them with your wife. If it's a male, get his number, stay in touch with him. I, I give my number out to random people all the time. 
When I'm traveling, now I don't give it to people in church because some of y'all are crazy, but there's people when I'm traveling, I'm at airports, when I'm at camping, wherever, and we're sharing about our ministry, sharing about the gospel, what we do, how God's changed our life, and I'm sharing my testimony, I give them my number and I get their number. Yes, Isaiah Saldivar is not too cool to give out his number. I give my number out. Hey, if you need anything, if you need prayer, let me know. Wherever you're from, I can connect you with the church. We should be doing that. We should be working to disciple these people. Now, you don't have to give up, you know, and be with them every single day, but you need to be willing to disciple them. Tip number six, expect the power of God. We cannot, dis we cannot witness and share our faith without the power of God. Power evangelism is extremely powerful and biblical. Healing the sick. When somebody gets healed in their body, you don't need to convince them. Ask them if they have pain in their body. Ask the Holy Spirit for a word of knowledge and then lay your hand on them and watch them get healed. I'm telling you, it's incredible when somebody gets healed, you no longer have to debate them. You no longer have to debate them. What was number five? Number five was be ready to disciple them. Number five was be ready. Number six is expect the power of God. Healing, ask for a word of knowledge, casting out demons. Now, some of you say, well, brother Isaiah, you told me I shouldn't cast out demons from unbelievers. True, but if you're ministering to somebody and they genuinely wanna serve God, turn to God and become a Christian, there's no problem doing deliverance on them. The people that I won't do deliverance on are people that don't wanna serve God and are in rebellion and living in sin. But if you're ministering to somebody and they go, man, I want that. I wanna serve God, pray with me, pray for me. I wanna repent. That's a perfect chance to pray with them and to pray healing and to do deliverance. Right there on the spot, you can do deliverance on them. Again, the people I don't do deliverance on are people that want nothing to do with it that are in rebellion. But if they're genuine, cast those devils out of them, get them saved, get them healed, cast the devils out of them, and then invite them over to your house and baptize them in your bathtub. You can do all four in one, a little combo combo kit right there. No problem. Miracles were essential in the New Testament church growing. Acts chapter four, verse 30. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are per performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So miracles grow the church. John 14, 12. Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the, the works I do and even greater than these because I'm going to the Father. I know a lot of these preachers say, well, we're not allowed to do the same works. Maybe because you're not, don't say we can't. Jesus said it. His word is way more powerful than yours. Never listen to someone that says Jesus didn't mean what he meant. Jesus said it. He meant it. It's the same in English as it is in Greek. We are called to do the works of Jesus and even greater works. This is what your Bible says. This is what your Bible says. So don't let somebody interpret it. Don't let the devil use somebody to tell you you can't do the works of Jesus. Expect miracles. Romans 15, 19. By the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God, so from Jerusalem all the way round to Lyricum, I fully proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, I'm using the power of God, I'm using miracles, signs, and wonders to fully proclaim the gospel. So expect the power of God, Acts 19, 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So God was doing the work through Paul's hands and God can work through your hands. Okay, number seven, very practical. Are you guys ready? This is a good one. I'm glad I wrote this down. Number seven is... Dress appropriately. Can we get ones in the chat? I know that's so obvious. Well, duh, but it's not duh. When you're sharing your faith and you're wearing inappropriate clothing, you become a distraction to the person you're ministering to. We are trying to build, write this down, bridges, not barriers. So ladies, please, I'm asking you, when you're at the revival meetings, when you're sharing your faith, when you're at work, when you're at your job, Wear appropriate clothing. You do not need to be wearing booty shorts and a low cut shirt to get attention. That's not the type of attention that you want. Some ladies say, well, all men are dogs. Well, look at the people you're attracting. If you dress like a piece of meat, the dogs are gonna come out. That's the bottom line. So dress like a daughter of God, dress like a man of God. Come on, man. You don't need to be all right out of the gym, no shirt on oiled up, trying to witness to the lady outside the gym. You need to dress appropriately. If you're presenting the gospel, I want you to remember this. You are a representative of God. You're a representative of God. So make sure that you're representing Christ properly. Don't represent Christ. Your body's a temple of God. You don't need to be cutting those, wearing those real low cut shirts, real hiked up shorts. And this is for guys too. Come on guys. Nobody wants to see all that. Some of you guys, why is this a trend to wear shorts that are like all hiked up on you guys? Some of you guys need to wear appropriate clothing. You don't need to wear little tight shorts. If you're a guy, should be wearing normal shorts that fit you. Same thing with your, come on guys, help me. We need to be appropriate when witnessing we're royalty. Well, you might say, well, it's hot outside. I have seen Marines at funerals in 110 degree weather wearing a full uniform. 
So if the Marines can wear that at a uniform at a funeral as you know a sign of prestige, a sign of I'm a I'm a warrior, I'm in the army, I'm wearing right clothing, then you can wear proper clothing to evangelize. Now I'm not saying, oh, you have to wear this all the time, this, but don't be sharing your faith wearing inappropriate clothing. That's the bottom line. Don't bring reproach to God. I need to throw that in there. Okay, number eight. This is good stuff. Number eight is be open for divine appointments. I believe God constantly sets up divine appointments for us if we are available. Now, don't expect God to use you if your schedule's full. So leave room in your schedule for divine appointments. How many of you have been in a moment where you're witnessing to somebody and you mo you realize this is a divine appointment? You're here for a reason. I'm here for a reason. This was God that set this up. God will set up divine appointments. One example is in Acts 8.29. Says, and the spirit said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. And Acts 8:39 says, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and they went on rejoicing. So this was a divine appointment. The spirit prepared the eunuch for hearing the gospel through Philip. And then when the, Philip was done, the spirit of God moved him to another place. So God will set up divine appointments. John 3:8. The Bible, re Jesus relates the Holy Spirit to the wind. It says, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone born of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is mysterious. You don't know where he's always going. You don't know what he's always doing. He's always setting things up, okay? He's like the wind. You can't see him, but you know he's there. You could feel him. You could experience him. That's the Holy Spirit. So be ready this week for divine appointments. Pray tonight. Well, we'll pray at the end here soon in a few minutes. Lord, Set up a divine appointment. I'm available. I'm ready. Number nine. So number eight was divine appointments. Be open for divine appointments. And I want that in my life. I love divine appointments. I just had one a few days ago. I love it. Number nine. Don't get stuck on one method. These are all practical tips. These are not deep theologically. They're deep practically. Number nine is do not be stuck on one method. There's many ways to share your faith with people. So here, let me give you a couple ways. In person. Okay. Sharing person to person. That's how the gospel spreads through Instagram, through Snapchat, through Facebook Messenger, through TikTok. This is one of the only times in history you could literally make a TikTok, start preaching on it, and thousands of people will see your video. It's absolutely crazy. It's amazing. I know you hate TikTok. I hate TikTok. I do not go and scroll. I cannot stand TikTok, but I have all my videos on there because I want to reach people. Just because I don't like it doesn't mean I shouldn't reach people there. So you don't need to scroll on it. Just upload videos, share your testimony, share the gospel, open air preaching calling people on the phone. Did you know this? This is like, whoa, revelation. You can call people on the phone and share your go share the gospel with them. You can do this. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's gonna get real crazy here. Sending a text message. Yes, you can text people verses, encouragement, prayers. You can share the gospel through a text message. Inviting someone to church. Starting a house church is a great way to share the gospel. Share in your home in a group setting, go out in groups and evangelize. These are all ways. So number nine is don't get stuck on one method. Number 10, last tip, number 10 of sharing your faith in a practical way is check up on them in one to two days. The Bible says the devil comes like a bird and he steals the seed, he steals the word to prevent them from being saved and prevent them from believing. So you need to be faster than him. So you need to check up on them. You need to meet up with them, baptize them, have Bible study, have Bibles on standby. Go to the Christian bookstore, buy 10, 15 Amazon Bibles, have them ready. So when you're sharing and witnessing at school, at work, because I know after this video, you're going to, because you feel convicted, you feel bold, you feel the Holy Spirit on you. You're going to give these Bibles out, share with people. Number 10 is check up on them in one to two days. A couple things to get to remember is not everyone's gonna receive the gospel, okay? Do not be discouraged. When someone doesn't receive the word, God would often tell prophets, you're gonna go preach, they're not gonna receive it, but remember, some plant, some water, it's God that makes the seed grow. And that could be a five-year seed, a 10-year seed. Your job is to plant the seed. If somebody comes and they don't, under, they don't receive it or they get mad at you, keep on going. Imagine Noah, 100 years building the ark and no one entered. Do not be discouraged, keep pushing, obey the word of God, if they don't receive it, target them in prayer. The Bible says the devil blinds the mind of unbelievers. Pray that God would remove the blinders. Pray that God would remove the blinders off of them. Someone said, what is number eight? Number eight is be open for divine appointments. Okay, I'll go over all of them at the very, very end during the time of talking, donations, and prayer. The last thing I want to note, okay, I have more stuff, but I'm going to give you one more. I'll do another video on this, is remember not to argue with people. We're trying to win. Write this down. Final statement. We are trying to win souls, not debates, okay? We're not trying to win a debate. This is not a contest. Do not argue. If they start arguing with you, defend your faith, 
and move on. Do not get in debate. Do not get worse off than before. Do not argue. God will have his way. God will work. Let the Holy Spirit work in their heart. Remember, the Holy Spirit's going to germinate that seed. The Holy Spirit's going to grow that seed. The Holy Spirit is the one that's going to do the heavy lifting. So you don't need to be arguing at them. You don't need to be shouting at them. You don't need to be telling them, oh, you're wrong. I'm right. And you don't know what you're talking about. Let the Holy Spirit move. Let the Holy Spirit do his thing. 